It's official, Jordan Subscriber Challenge where I had to shoot on the Pentax K01 is over. So for those of you that left the channel because of the K01 footage, I'm sorry, please come back. This is a great opportunity to do so. But for those of you that didn't mind the Pentax K01 footage, well, you can't really tell the difference anyway. So thank you for sticking with us and here we go. Welcome back to EPRV TV viewers. It's Chris Nichols here, and I've got a Canon EOS R5 and R6 with me because these have become incredibly popular. And so what I thought is if you're picking up one of these cameras, why not tell you what Jordan and I like to do as far as menu settings go? Give you a little intro to how we set up these cameras. So let's get to it. Now, the first thing that we're gonna start with is you gotta make sure you have an EOS R5 or R6 in your hands. This is an EOS R5. No, it's not. It's a Zeiss Icon. Like, you know, it's very easy to get confused here. So, you know, I mentioned this too because there's also older cameras like the EOS R and the RP and they do look physically very similar. But although some menu items will be the same, many will be different. So, and who knows what they're gonna do in the future. So, make sure first off that you're holding a Canon EOS R5 or, oh, see, that's an R6. There you go. EOS R5, R6. That's what we're focusing on today. They have identical menus. Now, number two, let's talk about image quality. And it really does largely come down to how many photos you're gonna be able to put on a memory card. Now, when I test a camera, I do JPEG plus RAW so I can show you guys both files, but you already know which workflow you're gonna go with. So what I do really wanna point out is C RAW is a new feature on here. A lot of cameras out there have a compressed RAW format. Now, these are no different. The compressed C RAW gives you more photos per memory card, about 40% more. It's pretty significant. What's the downside? Well, C RAW, you're not able to push shadows as heavily, you're gonna get more noise, but the image quality is still very excellent. You got a lot of pushability there. So really it's gonna come down to storage space. Do you really need more photos? Go see RAW. If you've got lots of storage space, go RAW and you'll be able to push those files even further. Now I also wanna to touch on the high format because this is a relatively new file format that these cameras support. So it's maybe a little confusing to find out where to actually turn it on. You go into the second menu, you go to HDR PQ settings and you hit enable. And then when you go back to your image quality settings, instead of JPEG, you'll now see HIF there as well. And yes, you can shoot HIF plus RAW, for example. So long story short, HIF files do have more dynamic range than JPEGs. There's some advantages there. It was originally intended that if you used an HDR display and shot HIF, you'd actually get to see that extra dynamic range. But for a photographer editing on software, you can also push and pull those files a little bit more. I still wouldn't say it's anywhere close to what RAW files can do. If I was gonna do some heavy pushing and pulling, that's what I'm gonna choose. However, if you want to have a JPEG kind of file that takes up the same amount of space but gives you a little bit more range to push and pull, Hyph might be the answer. I still want you guys to keep in mind though that your exposure settings and white balance should pretty much be where you want them to be for your final product because Hyph don't give you anywhere close to what RAW let you do. So option number three we're gonna talk about is shutter types. You'll find that in page six of the shooting menu. Mechanical, electronic first curtain, and electronic all have advantages and disadvantages. I'm gonna actually start with electronic first curtain. This option makes sense for a lot of people shooting. The idea being that you actually get less shutter shock. It's a bit more of a stable platform. You're still getting all the advantages of mechanical shutter, but it does have one big negative. It will change your bouquet if you're shooting really fast shutter speeds, you know, thin depth of field stuff. Stuff. So it will affect the bokeh throughout the whole photo, not just specular highlights. Everything will look like you shot it at a tighter aperture. If you want to leave your bokeh untouched, avoid this setting at high shutter speeds. So that brings us to mechanical shutter option. This is what we usually use when we test cameras because if we're testing a lens, we can't have that truncated bokeh. Now, the advantage is it works great. You do have a mechanical shutter speed maximum limit to how fast you can shoot, but on these cameras, it is still quite fast. The disadvantage, you will get a little bit more shutter shock when you're shooting, and that could cause some motion blur, especially at slower shutter speeds. Now, the third option we're gonna talk about is electronic shutter. Now, this doesn't have truncated bokeh, it is a very stable platform to shoot from and it actually does let you shoot up to 20 frames per second So you would think it makes sense for a lot of sports and wildlife It's also a silent shooting mode, which is nice. However, there are some disadvantages here as well Now first off if you're doing any sort of panning with the camera, especially with telephotos Like say following an eagle in flight across trees or something You'll get any verticals in the shot actually going diagonal that can be really annoying It's not terrible on these cameras, but it is noticeable. So keep that in mind. Another issue, if you're shooting under artificial lighting like LEDs or fluorescence in a gymnasium, you'll often get banding and it looks terrible. Now, if you're shooting mechanical shutter or electronic first curtain, you can still get flicker under those lights where you're gonna get 
different exposures from shot to shot, but you can turn on an anti-flicker mode for those two shutter types. You cannot use it for electronic shutter. The last thing I want to talk about for photography is the autofocus settings here. Now, first off, I want to mention tracking autofocus has become so effective now that it can often replace almost all of your other settings. Now, you do have a lot of the other classic modes, you know, single point, wide area, expandable, but the fact of the matter is tracking on the Canon is absolutely fantastic when you set it up properly. So let's get to that. Now you can either focus with your front shutter button or the back button A off on like I like to use, either one works. But when you use face tracking in one shot autofocus mode, it will basically just engage the eye and face detect features. Where this mode really comes alive though is when you use servo autofocus because now I can track on a subject and wherever it moves in the frame, it will follow it even if it comes towards me or away from me and that is very powerful. Now on the subject of eye detect, uh, you can easily engage this on or off so if you want to track something and not have it go to somebody's face, then you can turn it off. I usually like to set a custom button to do that so it's nice and quick. Now it is important to be able to differentiate quickly between human eye detect and animal eye detect when you are using that because the fact of the matter is first off, these have the best animal eye detect I've ever used on a camera system, but it doesn't work effectively on humans and vice versa. And unfortunately there's no super quick way to toggle back and forth between those two. You can go in the menus, but that's slow. You can set up a my menu function and then have that eye detect change there. That's a little bit quicker or you can dedicate a C1, C2 or C3 mode to either animal eye detect or human eye detect and then just click back and forth between the two. But that's, that does tie up two custom modes. I wanna explain one more thing about tracking here. Now, when you use tracking autofocus or some of the other modes like spot autofocus, one point autofocus, or the expandable autofocus areas, you're basically using a box to decide where you want the camera to focus. And you can move that box around with the joystick or with the touchscreen. both work great. Now, there is an option in page five of the autofocusing menu called initial focus point servo AF for face tracking. And you've got an auto option here, never use auto, don't let the camera decide, but you also have have a first option, initial point set, or the second option to use the autofocusing modes from spot, one point, or expandable area. This is basically how it works. I'll give you an example. If I'm in one point autofocus mode, for example, I focus on Jordan's face, then I move the box over to the far right and focus on his face there. If I then switch to tracking autofocus with the second option in the menu, it stays at that same position, the far right. Now, if I go and change this to the initial point, the first option, option, which I prefer, if I'm using something again like one point autofocus and I move the box over to the extreme right, if I then go to tracking, it doesn't start there. It has its own unlinked starting point. So it basically just means, are those focusing boxes linked for all those focusing modes or does focus tracking have its own box position that it remembers separate from the others? Now the last thing I want to talk about is your autofocusing case modes. It's page three and they give you a pretty good description of all of them. Case mode one is versatile and does work for a lot of situations, but we did find with testing that if you want to get the maximum hit rate, it really does pay to set the right case mode for the situation and then you'll get the highest success rate. And now for a brief intermission before we jump over to Jordan for the video settings, let's do this. If your name starts with L, let's click that subscribe button right now. I see Lorraine out there. Thank you for clicking. Lisa, uh, thank you. Larry, oh, you clicked it. Thank you very much. Ludwig, Ludwig, you haven't clicked yet. I'll wait. Ludwig, I see you out there. Okay, thank you Ludwig, you've clicked that as well. We really appreciate it. Let's go to Jordan. All right, let's talk about video settings on these. And I'm gonna start with two that are really easy to miss that are shared on both of these cameras. So let's jump on to autofocus page three when we're in movie mode. And we've got a couple options right at the top. We have movie servo AF speed, and this is how fast the lens motors will actually move. So I want it very fast and responsive if I'm gonna have someone moving towards camera, something like that. But I actually wanna really turn that down if I'm gonna be pulling focus from one person to another or one subject to the background. You don't want it suddenly snapping. It's very distracting, especially if your lens breathes quite a bit. But the second option can be pretty confusing. Movie servo AF track sensitivity. That's how fast if you have your focus point on a subject and say they move out of that focus area, how long it's gonna wait before it jumps to a new subject. And that can be incredibly distracting. So the vast majority of the time, I just have this set to locked on. It's always gonna be trying to track that initial focus point unless you tap on a new subject. 
Okay, but what if you want even more control by manually focusing or you're using adapted lenses that don't have autofocus? Well, generally with other cameras, I would turn peaking on. This gives you a little colored highlight around your subject, but it's with the R5 and R6. They actually have something way better. They have their focus assist mode. You put that box on the subject that you're looking to focus on, and you can actually see how far out the focus is. This is great if you wanna quickly snap focus, you'll be able to see as you get closer and closer until you hit your subject, or if you wanna do a slow pull, you can see until you're almost there and it'll light up green, you know you're perfectly in focus because it's using the camera's phase detect autofocus system. It's an amazing aid and people should really take advantage of it. One interesting thing about the R5 and R6 is they both offer 10-bit recording. However, accessing that actually depends on which color profile you use. So if you're using any of the standard modes, it's just an 8-bit camera. To unlock the 10-bit recording on these guys, you're gonna have to go to either C-Log or the HDR PQ modes on it. Now, there is one real advantage if you stick with the standard profiles though, the 8-bit recording is a lot easier on your computer than it is when you're using that 10-bit H.265 compression that we see in both C-Log and HDR PQ. The last tip I have is unfortunately specific to the R5. Hopefully they can address that in firmware. But a lot of the time I'm flipping through frame rates and I wanna do it quickly. I wanna quickly jump over and shoot some slow motion. So what I really like with the R5 is I have a video custom menu. So I like to set mode one to 24 frames per second, mode two to 60 frames per second, and mode three to 120 frames per second in 4K. What's great is it'll also remember the shutter speed that you've selected. So I can set it to 50th at 24, 125th at 60 frames per second and a 250th when I jump over to 4K 120. Unfortunately, that's not available in the R6. So to quickly cycle through frame rates, I do like using the quick menu for that. But remember, whenever you change that frame rate, you gotta remember in your back of your head, oh yeah, I also have to adjust my shutter speed to compensate. Hopefully Canon fixes that. So hopefully this helps guide you on how to best set up your R5 or R6. But if there's other cameras that you'd like our recommendations on settings, please let us know in the comments below. Don't forget, follow us on all those little things on the bottom of the screen there. And we will see you all again soon with some more DP Review TV.